All right, welcome back. We are ready to take on the rest of our GDP lecture. And it's interesting. You think about GDP, you hear the number all the time in the news over and over again. And even among a lot of economists, it's not entirely clear to people how it is calculated. And that can lead to some uh, weird things. So here's a good example. Uh, this was an event some years ago where Nigeria essentially changed how it calculated GDP. Um, so basically, almost overnight, the country's GDP increased by some 89%. Uh, so typically when a developing country's GDP uh, nearly doubles, people get suspicious. But in this case, it was actually nothing, uh, there was no deliberate attempt to misconstrue the numbers. It was actually just they changed the way they calculated their GDP. Uh, and in, in some sense, they changed it in a way that's good for reasons that we'll talk about soon. But yeah, so essentially what's, this is what happened here. So before South Africa was, uh, for a long time, the largest economy in Africa, and then Nigeria basically uh, <laughs> vaulted ahead, um, as the, the title implies, simply by changing the way it calculates GDP. Why might one do this? So let's suppose you are the statistician general of Nigeria. And so according to the usual method of GDP accounting, Nigeria's economic progress over the last 10 years, it's been pretty lackluster, not terribly great. But that's weird. You, that strikes you as not quite right, because based on household surveys, so asking actual households how their real economic conditions have changed over the past 10 years, it seems like there's been pretty good growth, that people are a lot better off than they were. So how do you explain this? Let's ponder that as we think about measuring GDP. All right, so we've got, um, so these are the questions, remember, we started with. Uh, so we're working towards that question of whether this is a great measure of welfare. But first, we have to think still more about how to calculate this. So this is what we covered last time, right? So GDP is the market value of all final goods produced within a country in a year. So you already have this all down in great, great detail. So let's forge on ahead to think a little bit more. Once we have GDP, we have the sense of what it means, uh, what can we do with it? So the most natural thing is to calculate how it changes, right? So GDP growth, you've probably heard this in the news as well. So if GDP is a measure of our country's total production, GDP growth is how much has our productive capacity increased? How much more did we produce this year than we produced last year? And so the way we do this, so this is pretty basic. I'm sure most of you uh, know how to calculate a growth rate, but just so make sure we're all on the same page. If we want to calculate GDP growth for the year 2005, so how much more do we produce in 2005 than in 2004? Take GDP 2005, subtract GDP in 2004, so this is just the level difference, literally how many more dollars of output do we have this year, and then we divide it by 2004 GDP. So basically we want to get the percentage increase over 2004, um, so this is going to give us a proportional increase, so we multiply that by 100. 100% to give us the percentage GDP growth. So here's just an example. If GDP in 2005 is $12,455 uh, billion, say, um, in 2004 it's $11,712 billion, then you can calculate uh, nominal GDP growth in this way. So you get it comes out to about 6.34%, right? Any questions on that? Pretty straightforward, all right. So now this is, um, I mentioned the term nominal GDP before. So this is an important point. It's gonna come up over and over in this class. The difference between nominal and real variables. So nominal, the name implies well, literally uh, something in name, uh, but really what it means in the context of GDP is something valued at current prices, so the price today. Uh, Whereas a real variable, 
is a variable valued at a price held fixed in some base year. Um, and I'll make this a lot more concrete in just a moment. But the point I want to emphasize right now is that real GDP is kind of what matters for welfare because prices change over time, but as we'll discuss many times throughout this class, uh, changes in the overall price level, um, that's really just changing numbers around. It's not actually changing the facts on the ground. It's not making us any better off, all right? So, so we've had a chance to get this down. We'll make this a little bit more concrete, all right? So, everyone got this down? Yeah, these slides are mainly information. Um, so let's think about how we would calculate nominal GDP in 2005. So remember, GDP is the market value of everything we've produced. So suppose we have a list of all the things we've produced. We've produced you know, 10 apples, 20 oranges, 300 watermelons, et cetera. We have that list. And we know the price of an apple was $3, the price of an orange was $5, the price of a watermelon was $10. And so to calculate nominal GDP, we would you know, take the value of each of those, right? We talked about that last lecture. Um, and so nominal GDP in 1995 is all of those 1995 quantities times their 1995 prices, and then we add it all up, right? And then nominal GDP in 2005, it's exactly the same. It's just we use 2005 prices and 2005 quantities, right? So that's going to give us GDP in each of those two years. And if we wanted to calculate the growth in nominal GDP between them, we just take the growth rate, the difference, right? Just like we talked about a moment ago, right? This is all quite basic. Now, real GDP, for that we have to basically, all right, so essentially there's two issues here. The problem with nominal GDP is that two things are changing, right? We can see this here, between 1995 and 2005, both prices and quantities are changing. But if we want to think about GDP as a measure of production, we really don't, we just want quantities to change, right? We want the stuff we've actually produced, we want to allow that to change but we want to value it the same. We want the prices to stay fixed. So that's the idea behind real GDP, right? We hold the prices fixed. So let's suppose that we choose 2005 as what we call the base year. So it's called the base year because we are taking prices from that year as fixed. We're gonna use that, we're gonna hold that as the, the star in our sky that we hold fixed. And then um, we are going to take those prices back to 1995. So here, this is how we calculate real GDP. So the quantities, this is exactly the same as see on the previous slide, right? 1995 quantities, 2005 quantities. Um, but the difference is the prices. So for real GDP in 1995, we used the 2005 prices. So what was the price of an apple in 2005, the price of a watermelon, et cetera? And then we take those prices and use them to calculate GDP both in 2005, but also in 1995. And that gives us real GDP in these two years. And so if we were to calculate real GDP in each of those two years, we could take the growth rate, just as we talked about before. And that gives us, whoops, a different number, right? So um, in this case here, we're using 2005 as the base year. So real GDP, nominal GDP are the same. Um, but the difference is that real GDP in 1995 is now different, right? So before nominal GDP in 1995, say it was $7.4 trillion, it's $9 trillion when we use 2005 prices to calculate it, right? And so real GDP growth is considerably lower in this case. It doesn't have to be, but in this case, it's a lot lower than nominal GDP growth was, all right? And basically the difference between those um, is the increase in the overall price level, all right? So let me, yeah, there's a question. Not necessarily. So you can't necessarily, so, so if there are only one item in the economy, then yes, it would be the same. But when you have more and more items, it's gonna depend a little bit on the relative weighting of those. Um, so it will not necessarily give you the same number if you use a different base year. Other questions? Yeah, over in the back. 
Um, you mean, is there a standard of which year to use as the base year? Yeah. Nope, totally arbitrary. <laughs> um, in fact, if you go look at, um, say, so I'll tell you about FRED in a moment, the Federal Reserve Economic Database, uh, but basically, you can find GDP for different base years. Um, and this gets really complicated when you talk about a country like India, which um, the base year means a little bit more than prices, but uh, we will not get into that for this class. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Sorry? Okay, we'll get to that in just a so. Uh, the question is, what is the difference between real and nominal GDP? What does it mean in practice? I will show you that in just a moment. Any questions on the definitions before? probably seems really abstract right now. Let me actually show you an example. So let's suppose we have two situations when we have a doubling of nominal GDP. So let's suppose in 2000 we produced three oranges and two apples, and the prices were $3 for an orange and $2 for an apple. Right, and so we get that nominal GDP was $13. Now let's suppose in 2014 we produced six oranges and four apples, right? So twice as much of each type of fruit, um, and the prices remain the same as before. So now, of course, we've doubled our production, and so our nominal GDP has doubled as well. It's come to 16 or $26, right? That is one way we can double our nominal GDP. The other way is suppose that the amount of fruit we produced in 2014 is exactly the same as in 2000, but the prices of everything double. Right? And so once again, we have a doubling of nominal GDP, right? Nominal GDP is $26. But nothing has changed, right? We have the same number of oranges, the same amount of apples. We're not any better off. But it looks as though we're better off because our nominal GDP has gone up, right? And so this is the problem with nominal GDP. You just have increases in prices. You've basically changed some numbers around, even though you haven't made anyone better off, and somehow you get a bigger number. So how does real GDP deal with this? So if we were calculating real GDP and we were using the year 2000 as our base year, so remember this is real GDP in 2000. If we're using 2000 as the base year, um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so make this a little bit more complicated. So let's suppose this is uh, the year 2000. Remember it's the same as before. And in 2014, we increased the number of uh, oranges, the number of apples, um, but we also changed one of these prices here. So basically, in the year uh, 2000, we have uh, $3 per orange, $2 per apple. In the year 2014, $4 per orange, $3 per apple. And so now we have a situation that's a lot more complicated than before, right? Normally, you don't just have quantities increases in prices staying the same or vice versa, you'll have, as in this case, an increase in production, but also an increase in prices. Now, to make this real, so nominal GDP in this case has gone up, of course, it's gone from 13 to $25, but we know part of that is just an increase in prices. So to deal with that, let's just hold the prices fixed at the 2000 level, right? So we just take our year 2000 prices, stick them in here, so now the total value of our oranges is $12, the total value of our apples is $6, and so we come out to $18, right? So this is 2014 real GDP calculated at 2,000 prices, right? And the difference between that $25 of nominal GDP and $18 of real GDP, that is, uh, that is sort of meaningful. It's actually a measure of the change in the overall price level. So if we take 2014, we value it first in nominal GDP using our 2014 prices up here, get $25, our real GDP using the uh, 2000 prices, we get $18. We can define a number, a statistic called the GDP deflator. It's really just taking nominal GDP, dividing it by real GDP, and then multiplying by 100, so it's an index. This comes out to be 139.89 in this case, so you have the general definition up here. And this is useful because it tells us something about how much prices are increasing, the overall price level is increasing. Uh, so as we'll see later on, this is one measure of inflation. We'll talk about another one um, after the midterm. 
uh, but this is our first measure of inflation in this class. Why is this a measure of uh, inflation, which uh, is the in, a change in the overall price level? So let's suppose that um, instead of this case, so in this case we had that in 2014 the price of oranges was $4, the price of apples was $3. If instead the price of oranges were $6 and the price of apples were $5, right? So basically prices rise by more. Now nominal GDP rises by more. Real GDP, of course, stays the same because we're keeping uh, this, uh, we're calculating this with the 2000 prices, so that's not going to change if your 2014 prices increase. Um, in this case, nominal GDP is increased, real GDP is in, uh, stayed the same, so our GDP deflator must increase, right? 39 over 18 versus 25 over 18. And so now basically you can see here, in these two cases, production has stayed the same, right? There's the same amount of fruit as before. We've only changed the price level, and so that means we have an increase in the GDP deflator. So this tells us that in this case, prices rose by this much, they rose by a lot more in this case. Yeah. Um, so he's asking whether we can use this to track the values of different currencies. Um, so tracking the value of different currencies, you can use the exchange rate. Um, the nominal exchange rate, we probably won't have time to get to exchange rates in this uh, class, but where this comes in handy is if you want to calculate the real exchange rate, so the real purchasing value. Um, other questions? Okay. So if you want to figure this out, so suppose you wanted to get GDP. I want to mention this because it's very likely you will have to find GDP or the GDP deflator or some other statistic at some point in one of your classes, uh, you can go to FRED. So it's actually stunning. If you go to Google and type in FRED, um, the first thing that comes up is not Fred Flintstone or um, <laughs> uh, a person, but in fact the Federal Reserve economic data uh, maintained by the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, we'll talk about what the Federal Reserve system is after the midterm. but. If you go to this database, you can find that they have all these really nice statistics. So here you can see one example is billions of change, $2,009. Um, so this is real GDP with 2009 as the base year. All right, so you can actually see this. They'll have it from 1929 to 2013. I think I've showed you this series at some point. Um, if you look around on there, you can also find, for example, the GDP deflator uh, with 2009 as the base year as well. If you can't find it, you could actually figure it out yourself by looking for uh, nominal GDP and then just dividing through by uh, real GDP with 2009 as the base year, right? Make sense? All right, so you just check if you are following along. So we have a series of GDP here. So this is for California. We can calculate GDP for a state as well as for a country. Now take a look here and tell me which of these is the base year or if there's not enough information, tell me there's not enough information. 
to take another 30 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, so do this. You have to remember the definition of nominal and real GDP, right? So nominal GDP is prices this year times quantities this year. Real GDP is prices in a base year times quantities this year, right? Cover that, said it a few times now. You're probably sick of hearing it now, but that is the definition. Now think about what is, suppose I apply this to the base year, right? So then if we sub base year in for this year, what do we get? Nominal GDP in the base year is the price in the base year times the quantity in the base year. Real GDP in the base year is price in the base year times the quantity in the base year, right? They're exactly the same. Um, so the way you know something is the base year is because nominal and real GDP will be exactly the same. Um, or equivalently, the GDP deflator will be equal to 100, all right? So in this case, it's 2009. Um, looks like most of you spotted that. Stay, uh, Nice thing to keep in mind. Just sort of being able to use these definitions to figure things out like that is uh, quite useful. All right, any questions on that? No? All right. So we've taken the time to define real GDP. Why do we do that? Because most economists would say real GDP is uh, a much better measure of welfare than nominal GDP. So. Um, especially if you're looking at the newspapers in a developed country, so in the U.S. or Britain or any other um, somewhere in the Eurozone, usually they'll report nominal GDP because uh, that's sort of the first thing that comes up. Uh, but real GDP is a much better measure, especially when you're making comparisons over time. Uh, why? Precisely because of what I showed you earlier, right? Nominal GDP growth conflates changes in output with changes in prices, right? It gives you both of them together, and that's not terribly helpful if we want to think about how much wealthier our society is. Um, whereas real GDP tries to hold the prices fixed, and so uh, in some sense, all that is changing is the quantities, and all that's, all that's changing is how much stuff our, our economy manages to make, all right? So let me just give you an example of this. Uh, so this difference would matter in a country like the U.S., especially if we're looking from, say, 1929 to now. Uh, but it really matters in a developing country like India, where inflation has been quite spectacular at certain points. So the blue line here is nominal GDP growth. So every year we've calculated the growth rate over the previous year. Um, that's nominal GDP growth. Uh, and orange is the real GDP growth. So you can see in some years, this is a pretty big difference. And in some years, they actually go in the opposite direction, right? So if you look at around 1980, it looks like nominal GDP growth was positive and quite high. In fact, it was higher than the previous year. Real GDP growth, it was clear this was a horrible recession. They're going in opposite directions. And so in some ways, looking at the nominal GDP would be quite misleading. And now let's suppose that you wanted to take this GDP growth and calculate, okay, relative to 1952, how much uh, higher is GDP in 2012, 2013 in India? Now, if you did this with real GDP, um, you would get that India's GDP has increased about you know, 20 fold, right? So real output has risen 20 fold. And that's pretty good, actually. You know, um, relative to uh, 1950s, the average India or India as a whole produces 20 times as much more as much stuff over the course of 50 years. That's not bad. If you were to do this with nominal GDP, 
you would calculate that India produces about 988 times as much stuff. Uh, so if that had actually happened, India would produce more than every other country in the world combined. Uh, India does not produce more than every other country in the world combined. Um, and so this gap is enormous because the rate of inflation in India is about 10, 11% per year. So prices are rising by 10, 11% per year. And that's going to give you a very misleading impression of how much better off Indians are, right? So you really need to use real GDP to get the right answer or at least get some meaningful answer when you're thinking about changes in welfare over time, right? All right, so before I get on this, any questions on real and nominal GDP? No? All right, another word you hear all the time is recession. Uh, so heard many times we had a recession in 2008 through many, many years afterwards. Uh, what does that mean? To be totally honest, the definition of a recession, at least in the US, is kind of vague. So there is a research organization, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, and basically, so it has a definition. Um, so a significant widespread decline in economic activity, blah, blah, blah. Basically, um, bad stuff happens, right? Uh, and so then the NBR announces at some point, we are currently in a recession. And that is when we are in a recession in the US. It's really kind of odd, right? It's just this organization. It's somewhere in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, basically, Cambridge, Mass. And it tells us we are in a recession. And therefore, we are in recession. Um, it's a little arbitrary, but at least it's concrete, I guess. <laughs> um, whenever they say we're in recession, we are in recession. Now, that is not true everywhere, right? Uh, so the European Union, in particular, has a very, very simple, straightforward definition. You have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, then we're in recession, right? Now, these definitions are both a little arbitrary. Neither of them is perfect. Uh, so in the case of this definition, for example, you could have GDP, real GDP uh, decrease by 10% one year, increase by 1% the next, fall by another 10% the next year, and then increase by 1%. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. At no point during that would you be in recession by this definition, um, even though you might think we're a whole lot worse off than we were before the cycle of uh, decreases started. Um, but as I said, it is concrete. So, if we wanted to actually look at the recessions that the country has gone through, so this is in the U.S. and these shaded regions here, if you can see them are the official NBR recessions. So it's interesting, you can see that, so this is the average GDP growth, this red line. You can see we get below it quite often, um, but we are not shaded that often. So here is the most recent one, of course, uh, in 2008. Uh, this graph cuts off before we even get to the end of that. But uh, these are sort of the official recessions. These are sometimes called the NBR recession dates. All right, so quick review of all of that. So nominal GDP, as I said, goods produced, valued at current prices, real GDP. Um, take those same goods, that same amount of stuff produced, and then you value it at prices fixed in some base year. This lets you make uh, comparisons of GDP across time. You can define this thing, the, nominal, the, the GDP deflator. It's just the ratio of nominal to real GDP multiplied by 100. So it equals 100 in the base year. And the point of this thing is to give you some measure of how overall prices have changed, the overall level of prices has changed. So we think not, real GDP is usually a better measure of welfare, but it's not always what's reported in the news. Um, and as we said, a recession, it's roughly speaking a decline in production, um, although what exactly it means uh, is going to depend on where you are. In the US, it's going to depend basically on what the NBR says. All right. Any questions on any of this stuff? No? All right, so how do we go about 
thinking about GDP. So there are different ways to measure GDP and different ways to divvy up production. So we want to think about of everything that is produced in our economy. Um, we can think all of it has to be bought. So the national spending identity is uh, the most important approach to both measuring GDP and also splitting up where GDP winds up, how our production ends up being used. So this approach to measuring GDP, the idea is that everything in our economy that is produced has to wind up somewhere, right? Every orange is probably either eaten by someone or winds up in somebody's refrigerator or whatever. Um, so the question is, who does it? If it is bought by a household, it is consumed, right? So C here is the market value of consumption, goods, and services. Um, or maybe it is, uh, in the case of an orange, this is a little bit harder to see, but if we were talking about a computer, for example, if it is bought by a business to be used in that, we can call it investment. So investment, uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about this in uh, when we start talking about the solo model, but investment is the creation of new capital, where capital is uh, stuff that we use to produce uh, other things, so things we use to produce output. G is the value of government purchases, so the orange, the computer, might instead be bought by the government, either the national government or the state government, and so then we call it a uh, call it government spending. Um, so this is one point, this is not count things like transfer. So when you get social security, that doesn't count as uh, government spending from here because it has to be what is actually bought by the government. Uh, and the other thing we can do with our output is uh, sell it to foreigners. Um, so exports are things we produce that we sell abroad. Uh, imports are the opposite, things that we buy from abroad. And so we'll talk about why we um, talk when we think about net exports, but net exports are exports minus imports. So the idea is everything that's produced is either bought by households, bought by firms for investment, um, bought by the government, or bought by foreigners. And so one way to measure GDP is to just figure out how much have households bought, how much have firms bought, how much has the government bought, how much have foreigners bought. And then that is, in some sense, going to add up to total production. So if measuring total production, going to every single firm, every single household, asking how much have you created, um, if you can just figure out how much everyone has spent, that's another way to measure GDP. It's also another way to think about what, um, who is getting uh, everything that is produced in our economy. And so this is, will come up in very, handy, very much in handy when we think about aggregate demand uh, in our model of uh, recessions and booms and busts later on in the second part of the class. All right, so let me give you a concrete example of this. So let's suppose that our total production in the economy is two oranges, three apples, and five cars. All right, now, Using output to measure GDP, we can do this. We've talked about this, right? So we take our um, the price of apples, multiply it by the total number of apples, price of oranges, multiply it by the number of oranges, et cetera, et cetera. And so we get that our economy produced $62 worth of stuff. So think of this as nominal GDP. Now let's suppose that one orange and two apples were bought by households, right? So total consumption spending in this economy is $7. Let's suppose firms, domestic firms, bought $23, um, so two cars and an orange, so $23 worth of stuff in investment. Suppose the government bought an apple. Barack Obama wanted an apple one day, and so he bought this apple, and so the government spent $2. And three cars were bought by foreigners, and so our exports, our net exports were $30, right? Now, if we add that up, total aggregate expenditure, so consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, take all those numbers, add them up, and lo and behold, it comes out to $62, right? The same number. Why? Because we're basically measuring the value of the same stuff. We are just divvying it up, like splitting it up into these categories based on who bought it, and then adding up that in each of those subtotals, right? So is everyone convinced that these will give you the same number? Yeah? Okay. 
So in the actual GDP, uh, or in the actual US, our actual GDP looks like this. Um, so the vast majority of it is actually consumption, so households buy the overwhelming majority of what we produce. Um, the government is the next biggest buyer, so um, certainly a lot smaller than consumption, but bigger than investment, actually. Um, and our net exports are negative. So in other words, we are buying more from foreigners than we are selling to foreigners. Uh, and so this may seem a little odd to you. So the, your first immediate impulse from looking at this is net exports is negative. So if imports are greater than exports, net exports is negative. And so we are just going back to here. Right, we are adding a negative number. It looks like you know, trade is lowering our GDP. What's going on here? Um, that is actually not what's happening. Uh, so this is literally, this has nothing to do with the effect of trade on the economy. This is just accounting. So let me give you an example here. So suppose in our earlier example, we have all of our apples, oranges, and cars that we produce, but we also have households buy a bunch of oil from abroad. And so the oil costs $15 per, I don't know what this is, a oil well. <laughs> you buy an entire oil well worth of oil, it costs $15. And so households have bought $37. Now if you were to go and just add up total spending as consumption plus investment plus government spending plus just exports, not net exports, you get that aggregate expenditure is $92. But we know that our total production is only $62, right? we are somehow getting the numbers wrong here. And the reason is because we didn't produce this oil ourselves, right? The households bought it, but it's not, it wasn't produced in this country. And so to adjust for that, we subtract away the, the value of the imports, right? You know, we bought this, but we didn't produce it ourselves, and so we want to make sure that we are not counting it towards our production, our measure of production within the boundaries of this country. So we subtract that out, that's why we have net exports over here, and then we get back to the right number. All right? Everyone understand that? Basically, we subtract out the value of imports. It's just an accounting thing. All right? Make sense? All right, so quick review. Aggregate expenditure ID, Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. So C is consumption, I is investment, G is government spending, NX is net exports, where net exports is exports minus imports. And we subtract out the imports as an accounting correction, right? Any questions on any of this? No? All right, so this is how we measure GDP. Uh, that seems all nice and quite handy on paper. Uh, here's the problem. When you take it to the real world, it gets a little bit messy. And so there are actually problems with GDP, and those problems are getting worse and worse, as a matter of fact. Uh, GDP is not nearly as good a measure of economic value, and certainly not as good a measure of welfare as it once was. So. Here are two biases in our measures of GDP. Um, so first of them is that GDP only counts the formal economy. When I say the formal economy, I, know, I mean the, GDP, uh, the parts of the economy that are known to the government. So a firm starts up, you have a shop. Um, if it registers with the government, you know, with a tax authority or whatever, then it counts towards GDP. If it doesn't tell the government that it exists, there's no way for you to count it towards GDP, right? How's the National Statistic Office going to find it if they don't know it exists? Um, now, this is not such a big deal in a country like the US. Most firms that are producing things are known to the IRS. Um, we find them and we tax them. But in a country like India, in a country like Ghana, basically in developing countries in general, GDP only counts the formal economy, and that's a problem because the vast majority of production is not formal, right? If you find a stall selling um, toothbrushes on the side of the road in Bombay, it's probably not formal. Um, but it is producing something, and that is not being counted towards GDP. Uh, so this is sort of a flaw in the official calculation. 
So there are ways to figure it out, typically through surveys. So um, in the case of India, so this is not so much uh, illegal activity, but um, off the books activity in general, they'll use household surveys to figure out production done by households, the income they earn, and then try to use that to sort of adjust the numbers. Right? Other questions? So it's interesting because apparently Europe recently started trying to adjust for this. Uh, so Initially, there are, um, so basically there are all sorts of production that goes off the books, some of it illegal, some not. Um, so in this case, they actually revised to try to take account of this. So things like, you know, prostitution, drug peddling, cigarette alcohol smuggling, these things are illegal, but they're still production in some sense, right? These are goods and services. People are doing them, um, and so you kind of want to measure them as well. Now, in most European countries, this is not going to make a big difference. Um, in the Netherlands, although it does make a remarkably large, um, a large increase, uh, I guess, let's see. Yeah, that's not even illegal activity, so um, illegal but off the books activities. Once you adjust for that, it increases um, to make all these increases, it looks like it raises the Netherlands GDP by somewhere between uh, 2 to 8%. Uh, so these can make a reasonable difference. Now, in the case of other countries, so we talked about Nigeria. So this is essentially what they're doing, right? They are tracking the informal economy, and that increased their GDP by 89%, right? A huge increase, um, simply because a lot of their economic activity happens off the books. Here's another issue with GDP. It doesn't count non-market production. Um, so basically anything done in your home or your apartment or your dorm room or whatever, um, obviously the government doesn't know about that, so it can't really track it. So if you make yourself a sandwich, you are producing something. You are taking ingredients and doing something productive and delicious. Um, doesn't count towards GDP, right? How's the government going to know that you made that sandwich? How does it know the value of that? So let me give you an example. This can actually lead to some weird paradoxes. Um, so let's suppose that you have me and my next door neighbor. And so I and my neighbor in parallel decide that we want to make uh, apple pie um, separately. So I go to the store, I buy some flour, I buy some apples, and then I mix them together. Uh, this is how you make apple pie, right? You just take a bowl of flour and drop two apples in it and possibly put it in an oven. Um, this may be why I'm an economist and not a chef. Um, I put these things together and magically, uh, once I combine them with effort, my own efforts, I produce an apple pie. My neighbor does exactly the same thing. Apparently my neighbor is no more competent when it comes to producing pie. It's exactly the same ingredients, puts in exactly the same amount of effort, and gets a pie. And then we eat our pies separately, and that's lovely. Um, and so what happens to GDP statistics? So the government sees that I bought $5 worth of flour, $10 worth of apples, and my neighbor did the same, and so each of us spent $15, and so GDP increases by $30 because of the uh, the production of these pies. Now let's suppose that instead of eating my pie, I take it and I sell it to my neighbor. And I decide, well, okay, I spent $15 on the ingredients, but you know, I value my effort at about $7. And my neighbor does exactly the same thing, values his effort at exactly the same amount, and he comes and sells me his pie. So I take my pie, I produce it, I sell it to him, for $22, and he sells me his pie for $22. Now, the state of the world is exactly the same, right? We have produced exactly the same amount of stuff. We have these two god-awful pies. Um, we've just exchanged them. But really, we're both eating a pie. We both made and ate a pie. And yet, in this second world, GDP has risen by $44 instead of $30. Right? Same world, different GDP simply because we took a non-market 
transaction and turned it into a market transaction, right? So the difference is that when you make this market transaction, the value of your effort is actually priced in. And so this is missing from our GDP. Well, probably the biggest bias in all GDP calculations is that home production is not measured. And so this can result in biases across countries and across time. So in the case of uh, over time, the biggest example is uh, women getting involved in the labor force, right? So if you go back to, say, the 1950s, very, very few women were working. Uh, since then, there's been a massive increase in the number of women in the workforce. And the result, of course, is that we've had big increases in GDP uh, because women are going from doing sort of non-market work to really being in the market. Um, and so the bias in GDP arises because, so of course, there's going to be some actual increase in GDP because you have um, a better allocation of talent, right? You have brilliant mathematical minds who before were spending all their time cooking and changing diapers. Now they're proving theorems and uh, doing R&D. That's a good thing. That's going to increase GDP for real. But at the same time, it's also increasing GDP because what people were doing before was not counted, right? There is some economic value to, um, uh, to basically having, uh, you know, changing diapers has value, right? We pay people to do it. It must be valuable. Um, maybe not necessarily as valuable as what people switched into doing later on. But the fact that you didn't count it originally means that you are sort of uh, overcounting the benefit, or really the increase in GDP over time here, right? So because you haven't made that adjustment, you might get uh, GDP looking like it grew faster than it should have. So um, there have been various explanations for why GDP growth was so much faster um, over from between 1950 to, say, 1990 than uh, it has been since then. Part of the reason might be because of this. That's one possible explanation, probably not the entire explanation. All right? Does that make sense? And now you can get the same bias between countries, right? Um, and so this is the case we were talking about with Nigeria, right? So um, in these countries, a lot of production is done either off the books or sort of done at home, in particular, in a largely agrarian country like Nigeria, you might have people working in farms. So someone works on the farm with their family members. As far as the government is concerned, none of that production happens and is not counted towards GDP, right? That's all home production again. All right. So this will make developing countries seem even poorer than they actually are because a lot of their production just isn't counted, right? Just doesn't make it in the numbers, all right? So last point, GDP is a measure of production, but there are some things that absolutely, it simply does not count. And some of this, this is where it's getting worse and worse over time. Uh, so first of all, let's make it clear, GDP is not necessarily a measure of welfare, right? Now, production is useful for welfare, right? Having stuff um, certainly helps make us happier, um, certainly more so than not having stuff. But they're not the same thing, right? So you could have two countries with identical GDP. One of them is a lot happier simply because they have a lot more free time, right? You have leisure, and that's nice, right? Not working, that gives you a chance to do whatever people do for fun these days. Um, I might be out of touch. Uh, the other problem with GDP is that it does not measure free things, right? It's measuring transactions. We're measuring expenditure. But what about stuff you don't spend any money on, right? What is the value of Gmail? Clearly, Gmail has made people better off. And part of the benefit of that is counted because Google makes money from ad revenues, and that is counted. But there's also the side when you just send an email, right? You're able to send an email to someone on the other side of the world. This didn't even exist. So this creates two problems, right? First of all, you're trying to value something that did not exist 20 years ago. You couldn't send an email 20 years ago, or at least it wouldn't look anything like it does now. So how do you calculate real GDP for something that didn't have a price tag, right? How do you price something like, you know, I have a robotic vacuum cleaner? That didn't exist back in 1980. How do I find the base price? Like, if I want to hold prices fixed at 1980 levels, there was no price for a robotic vacuum cleaner in 1980. That just didn't exist. Now, how do you even do that? 
It's not clear. Um, it doesn't adjust for environmental costs, right? So if we produce a lot of stuff and then put a lot of smog in the air at the same time, if we cut down a huge number of trees, if we um, you know, destroy mountains, I mean, that's probably not making us better off, right? We need to adjust for that cost. GDP doesn't do it in any way. Um, last point about GDP, of course, it's measuring total production. So we talked about taking, calculating GDP per capita, that's just total production divided by the total number of people. But in the real world, all the stuff our country produced is not divided up evenly between every single person in the country, right? That's not how it works. Uh, different people have different uh, shares of the pie, and GDP doesn't deal with that, right? Uh, so if you have two countries, identical production, in one of them, everything produced belongs to one person, uh, that country is probably not so well off in many ways. GDP does not adjust for that. It does not deal with inequality in any way at all, right? So you have to keep these things in mind. What does GDP tell us and what it does not tell us? All right? So just review all of that. So GDP doesn't count informal or illegal or off the books production, um, certainly not, and home production is uh, in particular essentially stuff that's off the books, right? That can create all sorts of biases that you have to keep in mind when you're making comparisons, right? Um, GDP growth seems a lot less um, from, say, 2010 to 2016 versus GDP growth from 1970 to 1975. That might be because actual GDP, like you know, production actually rose quite a bit more from 1970 to 1975, but it might also be because what we're producing right now is a lot harder to measure, right? We've moved from producing a lot of manufactured goods, which are very easy to count, add up, uh, to things like IT services, right? Measuring the value of Uber, it's kind of hard. Uh, measuring the value of Gmail is really hard. Measuring the value of Facebook, um, it may be valuable, it may decrease your productivity, um, but either way, it's hard to measure, right? And that can create biases. And in particular, GDP, even if we could measure it perfectly, actual valid measure of production, it is not necessarily equivalent to a measure of welfare, right? So if we want to think about how well off our society is as a whole, we have to think about other things as well, all right? So any questions on GDP calculations? Yeah. Um, oh, who, like, so in the U.S., it's calculated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, Across, is there any international body? That's a good question. I mean, the OECD, um, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, they, I believe they have some guidelines, but again, in some sense, it's sort of left up to each country to calculate its own GDP. Um, and in particular, some countries, many countries do it differently. So the most common approach is the aggregate expenditure approach I showed you. Uh, India, until recently, used to use the factor income approach. So uh, this approach looks at how much everyone earns and uses that to calculate GDP. Those two methods will often give you very different numbers simply because some of them will miss certain production. Um, and so, and in particular, it's kind of weird when a country switches from met one method to another. So India's GDP may have had a massive increase because it switched. So, you have to sort of keep it as a caveat, right? It's a single number, so it's useful as long as they keep their method fixed over time, you can make some comparison. Um, but we'll talk about why GDP is useful to look at actually next lecture. The reason is that although it's quite imperfect, it's still extraordinarily predictive of a lot of other stuff. So I've told you it's not equivalent to welfare, but it is very strongly correlated with most measures of welfare. <laughs> yeah, other questions? No? Let's get back to the question we started with, our Nigerian miracle. So suppose you are the statistician general, Nigeria. So according to the usual method of GDP accounting, um, 
you haven't made as much economic progress as seems to be the case based on what you find in household surveys. So how do you explain this? So let's suppose that you calculate nominal GDP both using the standard method and a new method that uses those household surveys to measure the informal sector. All right, so let's suppose this is the formal and the informal sector. And if we were to go about this, um, and this, by the way, will give us a sense of how to calculate GDP, uh, which could be useful to you on the homework that you will have to turn in next week. Uh, so how do we go about doing this? So remember, we have consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. What do we want to use here? Anyone? A certain identity. <laughs> yes, the aggregate expenditure identity, right? So plus V plus NX. And so we can just add these up, right? So let's suppose we do this with the formal sector separately from the informal sector. So 2006. This is 200 plus 20 plus 30 minus 10. So this is 200, 220, 250 minus 10 plus 240. 2016, 215 plus 25 plus 40 minus 20. This is 235, uh, 240 plus 40 mi 280 minus 20. So we get. 60. And so under the old method, this is GDP, right? So under the old method, we would see that GDP growth shall represent. So GDP, we usually represent with Y. When I put an arrow over something, it means a growth rate. So GDP growth is old, so 2016, uh, yeah, or I can move it out, there. there we go, all right, so 2060 minus 240 divided by 240, so the base year, or the first year, sorry, oh, wow, <laughs> um, thank you for pointing that out, <laughs> um, and so if you take this, it comes out to 20 divided by 240, which is 10 over 12. Uh, so about 8.3%, right? All right, that's GDP with the old method. You know, 8.3%. I mean, it's not terrible, but still, it's over the course of 10 years for a poor country. That's, um, that's not what you would want. But let's suppose you now tally up the informal sector, right? 2006, the value of that is 200 plus 5 plus 0. So government spending on the informal sector is probably going to be 0. Um, if the government were spending money on it, they would probably know about it. Um, but anyway, this comes out to 220. 2016, this is 300 plus 30 plus 0 plus 20. This comes out to be 350. And now if you wanted to calculate real GDP total, We're just going to take these and add them up, right? So all right, so these are the differences. So obviously GDP is a lot higher once you count the informal sector. Um, now, so this was GDP growth, remember? 
hold method. All right. This is 610 minus 460 divided by 460 times 100. False. And this comes out to be about 32.6%. And that's a lot better, right? And so basically the point here is by missing a lot of the growth in uh, Nigeria's economy came in the informal sector, right? In particular, you can see this big increase in consumption spending totally missed by the formal method, right? So this, you know, this solves the puzzle. All right, any questions on that? Yeah. So basically the point is, um, so the formal sector, that's stuff that was known by the government. That's how we, we used to calculate GDP before. The informal is all production. It existed. It's just that we didn't know about it before. It wasn't on the books. So to get total production, we want to add up both of those things. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Okay. So that was GDP.